Time to take a glance at the Stahlhelm, the legendary German steel helmet, or to be more precise, several of them. Let's take a look at some real life examples. For this, we went to Castle Ebersberg in Austria, and here we have a 1916 edition and a second one. Both were used in the Austrian army. Then we have a version from 1935 and a version from 1942. So this is a wartime and this is basically a pre-wartime edition. Now before we take a further look at these helmets from both world wars, let's have some background information. In the first two years of the first world war, the Germans were using mostly leather helmets. Yet soon it was rather apparent that these helmets did not provide proper protection, especially against shrapnel. This was most obvious in the Vogese mountains, where Armeeabteilung Gede suffered extensive losses from shrapnel due to terrain. After an unsuccessful request to the Prussian war ministry for an improved helmet, the unit itself created a steel helmet on its own. That was produced in the artillery workshop. In total, 1,500 were produced. The helmet only protected the frontal part of the head and the nose. It had a weight of about 2 kilograms, which was about twice the weight of the later mass-produced Stahlhelm that most of us associate with German World War soldiers nowadays. The origin story for the Stahlhelm is actually, for German circumstances, rather straightforward. The author Bear notes that it had four fathers. One of them was Oberleutnant von Feldmann. He worked at the Prussian Ministry of War and saw the necessity of the introduction of a steel helmet due to the fact that the French were about to introduce their own and of course also due to various reports from the field hospitals. The two other men that were crucial in the idea and development were Professor Schwert and Professor Beer, the first an engineer, the second a doctor of medicine. After returning from a field hospital in August 1915, Beer talked to Schwert and noted that a lot of fatal injuries were caused by shrapnel that struck the head. To which Schwert replied that the steel helmet could prevent the penetration of shrapnel he encountered during his visits. Following this conversation, Professor Beer wrote a lecture to the doctor of the Second Army with the title Suggestion of the Advising Surgeon about the Acquisition of Protected Helmets, 15th August 1915. Thus, during two and a half months that I'm working here at the surgical department of the military hospital of the Palace of Justice as an advisory surgeon, there were no less than 102 skull shots in this one compartment of a single hospital. Of these were 71 artillery shrapnel and 19 small rifle shots. In 12 cases the type was uncertain. But there were still at least 8 shrapnel injuries. These injuries often of the most severe type were caused by remarkable small splinters. He further notes on the size of the shrapnel. The biggest splinter that was observed was no more than bean sized, most were not cherry stone sized, at times even much smaller. In this proportion to this smallness was the great power of these projectiles. This letter was later forwarded to the chief of the general staff of the field army, General von Falkenhayn, who forwarded the letter to the war ministry with a commentary that he also considers a protection against enemy firepower essential and requests the development of a proper head protection. It is quite interesting to see the rapidity of the development here. On the 15th of August, Professor Beer wrote the letter. Already on the 28th of August, it had reached Berlin, after being forwarded at least twice. Already on the 1st of September, Professor Schwert was called to Berlin to help with the development, where he arrived, and on the 4th, he attended a meeting on the development of the Stahlhelm. Based on this meeting, several criteria were established. The first point was that the steel helmet would replace the leather helmet because only that would guarantee that it was always available. The weight should not exceed 1 kilogram. Another notable point was that the helmet should protect against shrapnel, yet not rifle bullets, nor larger shell splinters. There was already a prototype of the helmet, yet it was rather crude. Thus the fourth father of the Stahlhelm came in, namely Werkmeister Master Workman Marx. He was instructed to produce a prototype which became the model of the later Stahlhelm. Note that the Stahlhelm was not the first German helmet. The company Marx worked for produced metal helmets for the cavalry before the war. Now there were several issues with finding a proper company to produce the helmets. Because some lacked machinery and or personnel, originally it was planned to use manganese steel, yet this was soon changed to nickel steel, since manganese steel did not perform well in firing tests. One major problem here was that 1.5% nickel meant that 15 tons of nickel were needed for 1 million of helmets. Yet nickel was a crucial war resource. Yet it was argued that in this case the nickel should be provided. The argument was 
The material question with the Stahlhelm is decisive. A helmet made of nickel-free material with the same resistance would be 15% heavier. Additionally, it is explained why the helmet must cover the whole head and why a helmet that would protect against rifle shots would be too heavy. There is no such thing as an excellent direction for the impact of the projectiles. This leads to the requirement that the skull must be protected to the neck and from there to the tip of the nose. A helmet constructed in the same way and safe from all sides against rifle bullets would weigh at least 5 kg and is out of question. As some of you might know, the Germans had special armor plates for some of the helmets, the Stirnschild, literally meaning forehead shield, but better described as foreheld armor plate, which could be mounted if necessary and was issued to selected units, like the Sturmtruppen, which I covered in a previous video. This part is also addressed in the same document. The requirement for current combat situations or for the fight in the trench to get a protection against rifle bullets can only be achieved by placing a forehead armor plate in dome shape on the helmet with about 5mm and the weight of 1kg. Note that the weight of the Stirnschild, which was finally produced, was 2kg. There was a short intervention by the Minister of War who wanted that the helmet would be strong in the frontal area than in the back area. Yet this was not possible due to the production technique, which was the drawing process. Zieferfahren. As such, only a multi-part helmet would have been possible, yet rivets would have reduced the resistance of the helmet and likely increased the production time threefold. Finally, in November 1915, the helmet was tested at the artillery firing range in Kummersdorf, which you probably know from the Second World War as the Army Testing Facility. Now here the data is conflicting, an often cited article by Professor Schwert notes around 400 steel helmets were tested. Yet the author Bear notes that he found different documents from the German War History Institute that states only a number of 74 steel helmets were tested next to leather, sheet metal and French helmets. The report states, of these 74 steel helmets, 28 are not hit by shrapnel fire, 12 are scarred, with sharp hits dented are 24 without breaking through the tin, with sharp hits penetrated were 10. All of the hit French helmets are penetrated. Based on that information, it was concluded that the helmet was good enough, since report indicated that the French helmet saved many lives already. And since the French helmet performed worse in the firing test than the Stahl helmet, it was a rather obvious conclusion. It was noted that the helmet likely could be improved, yet the time was more important in this case. Based on these conclusions, the production of 30,000 helmets for extended field testing was ordered. For field testing, several selected units like the Sturmabteilung Rohr were issued these helmets together with a questionnaire in December 1915 and January 1916. In April 1916, the various questionnaires and reports were analyzed. Interestingly enough, the results were quite diverse, yet mostly on the positive side. In various reports, the assessment by the troops varied between unreservedly favorable and more or less negative. Partly this was due to the vague idea of what the new helmet should do. Quite ironically, the Armeeabteilung Gede, which produced previously its own helmet, was very negative about the Stahlhelm. Yet probably one of the most interesting statements is from the closing words of the report of the Sturmabteilung Rohr. The helm was worn by the salt detachment also during the battles before were done, with great confidence and has protected many people from head injuries. The infantry envied the assault detachment about the helmets. Several helmets were taken away by the infantry of the assault detachment. As such, the decision was reached to introduce the Stahlhelm on a mass scale, with 1.2 million being ordered in April 1916. Around summer 1916, the first helmets arrived. Yet they were not distributed evenly. Priority was given to the units in the Somme and Verdun area. Thus, early on, other units, including those on the Eastern Front, had to wait. Soon, the number of orders increased to 5 million in October 1916. So let's take a short look at an Austrian World War I helmet which was the same design as the German one. At the top you see these large horn-like elements that served as ventilation holes and to hold the Stirnschild, the forehead armor plate. Here a short look at the interior of the helmet. Note that the red mark means it was not approved for front usage. Be aware that the interior of the helmets changed quite extensively and this is an Austrian variant. Now the Stahlhelm 16 was not without flaws, there were various issues. One major issue was hearing which was especially affected during wind. This was especially a problem during patrols. A major challenge was that for a long time there was no consensus what caused the hearing problems. One way this issue was addressed was by the introduction of a special variant of the Stahlhelm that had cut out areas for the ear area. 
These were usually called Fernmeldehelme, Signal Helmets, or Kavalleriehelme, Cavalry Helmets. The later name likely due to the fact that the Reichswehr used them for their cavalry troops. Another problem was that the helmet was often too shiny and thus gave away one's position. As such, the coating was often not sufficient. There were several remedies like using earth. Another approach was to use helmet covers, yet officially these were not introduced to the lack of resources. The introduction of fabric covers is currently not feasible due to the lack of raw materials. Covers are also not useful because they favor the formation of rust and thus reduce the resilience of the helmets. Yet we know that there were various helmet covers in use. It is not known if these were introduced later or only provided to special units like the Sturmtruppen. Additionally, regular soldiers produced them themselves, for instance from sandbags and other material. Based on these issues, changes to the Stahme were announced in October 1917. Yet only in summer 1918 a new model was issued to the troops, of which 100,000 had dimension cutouts around the ear area for field testing. The other helmets had the same shape, just a different chin strap and coating. Yet it should be noted that the interior of the helmet was changed several times over the course of the war. Something I don't discuss in detail. Now before we take a look at the Stahme of the second world war, some final notes on this one. In total, Germany produced more than 8 million Stahlhelme in the first world war, 7.5 million for Germany, additionally 486,000 for Austria-Hungary, 170,000 for Bulgaria and 5,400 for the Ottoman Empire. Note that Austria produced also around half a million of the Stahlhelm in its own factories. It would be too much to compare the Stahlhelm to other helmets, but there was an interesting distinction. Finally, it deserves to be emphasized that the German steel helmet of the first world war was designed exclusively for the best possible camouflage and unlike the British and French steel helmet bore no special badge or showed differences between teams and officers. This was a drastic break with the heat arrow common headgear, which showed rich differentiation for ranks and troop units. Note that there were several units that had decorated the helmets, yet officially this was not sanctioned. After the First World War, the Versailles Treaty required Germany to destroy a majority of its existing helmets. It keeps some for the Reichswehr. Although various shortcomings were known, the development and improvement of the helmet had low priority. Some changes were made to the interior in 1927 and 1939. Yet in early 1930, it was issued that no new helmets should be produced from the older models, due to weight, heat, hearing and visibility issues. The development and testing of a helmet made of vulcanized fiber Vulcan fiber was started, which is a material that is lighter than aluminium. Yet the Vulcan fiber helmet didn't fulfill the requirements. As such, an improved Stahlhelm was developed and finished in June 1935 and introduced as the Stahlhelm 35 with the Allgemeine Heeresmitteilung 289, which notes To overcome the drawbacks of the current steel helmet, obstruction of hearing and sighting, shooting and operating of optical equipment, New steel helmets were designed and tested in instructional and experimental units. These trials are completed. The official description according to the dress code of the Luftwaffe was as follows. The helmet consists of 1.1 to 1.2 mm, but at no point under 0.95 mm thick steel sheet. It is seamlessly drawn and hemmed on the edge around 0.5 cm wide. The width is dimensioned so the helmet protrudes on the sides around and above 20 mm from the head. At the front right and left and at the back there's a hole for the cotter pins for fixing the interior. On the side is another hole for receiving the ventilation elements. Now let's take a closer look. Here's the 1935 helmet. As you can see the ventilation hole is now just a rivet and the horns for the armor plate are gone. Similarly the size and form are a bit different. The visibility was increased by raising the front part of the helmet. Due to these changes it has also less weight. Note that quite a lot of other countries received the Stahlhelm as well. Probably most notable the nationalist Chinese forces, which received 220,000. This is quite interesting since the Chinese were at war with Japan, the future ally of Germany, which is a good reminder that Germany and Japan were not necessarily natural allies. Something I discuss in this video about panzers in China on my second channel. Anyway, during the course of the Second World War there were several optimizations made to the Stahlhelm. Yet they were limited. In 1940, minor changes were made. A different coating was used and the wappen shield, the decal, was not added anymore. And the ventilation holes were simply stamped and didn't use rivets anymore. Additional changes happened in April 1942 
in order to streamline the production process. So let's take a look at a quote from a document with the subject Streamlining the production of steel helmets. The beating of the steel helm edge is cancelled. The material saved thereby is to be put in the wall thickness in order to reinforce the steel helmet during the drawing process. Accordingly, the sheet's thickness of finished unpainted helmet increased from 1.20 mm to an average to 1.25 mm. So let's compare 1935 with a 1942 helmet. Here you can see the clear difference between the beaded 1935 and the non-beaded 1942 helmet. So I hope you liked this short excursion to some real life objects. Big thank you here to all my patrons and also big thank you to Cast Labelsberg for supporting us. Now a big thank you here to Andreas and Martin for providing access and support here. Also a big thank you here to Andrew for sponsoring the camera. And if you like what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon. As always, source the link in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.